Well, hello and thank you for joining us for Witness TV. I'm your host, Rachel Bryson. On today's show, we have a recap of the Diocese African and African American Mass and a commemoration of World Day of the Sick. Al Ganoza from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference then has a number of updates for us from the Capitol. Now, first up this week, this past Sunday, Bishop Ronald Gaynor celebrated a special mass honoring the African and African American faith and culture. Now, the mass was part of the diocese celebration of Black History Month and was held at St. Patrick Cathedral in Harrisburg. Welcome to our Black History Annual Mass. Black history begins in Africa. In one way or another, Africa became part of the black Catholic community in our America and in our Diocese of Harrisburg. What a blessing to have you, Monsignor Ronald. Thank you. Dear Bishop, as a messenger of Christ, I met great people who love our church. I listened to them. I have heard a lot. I saw many things and works that need to be done. Thank you for your acceptance. Let's continue to work together with true love and support to each other. This is our mission in the diocese. It's a huge, a huge mission, and everyone has a role to play in the Catholic Church of the Diocese of Harrisburg. Angele, thank you for those words and for your leadership in our diocese on behalf of our black Catholic community. And it's a great joy for us to be gathered together this morning during this Black History Month as we celebrate this Mass in celebration of the African and African-American faith and culture.
We want to thank the Lord who has made it possible for us to gather this morning to celebrate our common humanity, to celebrate our cultural heritage. We want to thank the Lord who has put forward for us the theme about reflecting on the ways we can build up our community through the power of love. We pray that the love we celebrate this morning will remain permanent and abundant in the hearts of each and every one of us. I see a homily as fundamentally prayer. Each one of us opening our hearts now to the healing grace and the healing mercy of God. My childhood experience of cultures and intergroup relations actually came from reading novels. And so as a 12-year-old sitting in a rural classroom somewhere in Nigeria, in Africa, I read a novel titled Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. And the story is simply about a guy called Okonkwo, the tragic end of Okonkwo, who was trying to resist colonialism. Of course, as a 12-year-old, I, I didn't know what that was all about. The whole idea of colonialism was way above my pedigree. I did not understand what they meant by post-colonialism or even the whole idea of Afrocentricity. As a 12-year-old, I read a book. I knew something was not right. But that was all I could take out of it. As a 12-year-old, I understood that the world is good. But I also knew that there were also problems sometimes in our cultural relations. As a 12-year-old sitting in the classroom somewhere in Africa, I didn't know where America was. America seemed like a fairy tale to me. But I read a book, a novel titled Black Boy by Richard Wright. I couldn't understand exactly what that was all about, but I knew that there was something that wasn't so right in the world of the novel. That was my only experience of culture and intercultural relations. Today, I teach intercultural communication at Messiah College. I teach students and explore with students the psychology of love and the psychology of hate. I explore with students ways we can build up cultural competency, how we can build co-culturality, cultural hybridity, and the list goes on and on and on. But there's something I've also learned. That in all my years of studies, something fundamental that I've learned that way before the science, way before psychology, sociology, anthropology, the good Lord has laid for us in the word of God the foundations of love. The foundations of cultural relationships has been laid for us so beautifully in the word of God. You are the light. I am the light that can bring peace to our culture. We are the ones holding the lantern, leading one another through the tunnels of division and divisiveness in our culture and in our nation today. I love this beautiful song that says, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And so as we celebrate this morning, 
the Black History Month, we pray that our country will become a more peaceful nation. We pray that the love of Christ Jesus will continue to bind all of us together regardless of the color of our skins. We pray that the love of Christ Jesus will continue to bind all of us together regardless whether your zip code is in the east shore or in the west shore. We pray that the love of Christ Jesus will become real and a life in our hearts today. In addition to Bishop Gaynor, Father Anthony Essek presented the homily and those attending the Mass listened to the sounds of both the Diocesan Gospel Choir and the Swahili Choir from the Lancaster area. When our next segment this past Tuesday, February 11th, was World Day of the Sick, which is annually celebrated on the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, commemorating the Blessed Mother's appearances to young Bernadette in 1858 in Lourdes, France. Caring for the sick is a virtue in the Catholic Church, and Bishop Ronald Gaynor commemorated this day by visiting with patients at the UPMC Pinnacle West Shore Hospital in Mechanicsburg. Now before celebrating Mass, Bishop Gaynor visited with several patients to give them the Sacrament of Anointing of the Sick. During this sacrament, a prayer is prayed over the individual, and sacred chrism is marked in the sign of the cross on their foreheads and palms. This sacrament is one of strength, peace, and courage to overcome the difficulties that go with the individual's serious illness or the frailty of age. Now during the Mass, Bishop Gaynor then said that as we celebrate the miraculous place at Lourdes, where many have come with great faith and experienced some form of healing, we are reminded that the Blessed Mother is our intercessor. On this day, not only do we offer prayers for those suffering from illness and also pray for those working in health care, but we also honor Mary as someone who has true maternal love for all of us. World Day of the Sick was instituted by Pope St. John Paul II in 1991. Well, it's budget season here in Pennsylvania. Governor Tom Wolf recently presented his proposed budget, and Al Ganoza from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference has some reaction from our legislators. Al? Hey everybody, Al Ganoza here with the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. I am the communications director with the PCC. We are the lobbying arm of the Catholic bishops around Pennsylvania. Recently, one of the big doings was the governor's budget address. You know, it's about a half hour, 45 minutes, and it's full of a lot of detail, but really it's only an outline of the, what he wants. It's basically his wish list, a, a statement, kind of like the State of the Union of what he would like legislators to approve. What he proposes and what is actually approved are very different things, and 
And when he gives his, his address in the Capitol right afterward, uh, legislators from all four caucuses, from the House Republicans and Democrats, and from the Senate Republicans and Democrats, they're all out there to give their reaction on what they think about it. Uh, we at the PCC also have our things that we prefer to see in the budget and things we don't want to see. And we will get to that in the weeks and months to come, as will legislators, as they do hearings. But right after the governor's budget address, we turn to legislators, especially some local ones around the Harrisburg area, to see what they had, they had to say. We started first, I ran into Scott Martin, senator from Lancaster County. Good to see that broad-based taxes aren't going to go up. Um, we wouldn't let that happen on hardworking Pennsylvanians. But, you know, this budget does go up by 4.2%. Uh, it takes away about $45 million from school safety funding for our public and private schools. And it gives increases in areas like his own office, about 9.2%. So you have to reconcile that. You know, this is only the starting point. I don't like everything that I see in here, um, but that's why we have this appropriations process and the budget negotiating. And I think in the end result, we want to make sure that we're funding things that actually work. Um, our kids are getting a quality education at an appropriate setting that their parents feel is right for them. Um, and, and so that's what these pro this process is going to get us to. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, that is something we are very concerned about, too. What he mentioned about the church security and the, the school security and the grants, which we thought the governor had been on board with. We'll see where that heads. We'll head to uh, York County, where we will hear from, uh, well, she was at the Capitol, but it's uh, Representative Kate Clunk from York County. I asked her what she thought of the governor's budget proposal. Well, a lot of it is the same old, same old of what we've heard over the past I guess five years now, and I really nothing new, nothing unexpected. Um, but what I'm really concerned about is the overspending that you see um, and the complete mismanagement at his executive level all across state government to see a supplemental coming in at over a half a billion dollars. Um, that's really unfortunate for taxpayers here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I really want to dig into the numbers. He's saying no new taxes, but what are going to be the gimmicks? There's going to be some sort of fund transfer um, and some borrowing that has to happen to make the numbers work. So we're going to have to dig into it, really see what's going on. Uh, but at this point, I know taxpayers down in York County are, are not going to like what the governor is selling right now. Um, but at the end of the day, we'll work together over the next couple of weeks to hammer out a budget that really hopefully protects taxpayers. And that's going to be really important to me. Also in York County, I went to a, a press conference where several Republicans were talking and heard from Stan Saylor, who's going to be chairing the House Appropriations Committee. He will have a big say in the budget hearings. This budget is more about spending, more taxes, more debt. It pays lip service, as the Senator said, to many of our special interests in the Commonwealth. But it lacks a lot of key details needed to be successful in implementing this budget is long on its uh, aspirations and short on details. And to hear the governor's budget address, two things struck me. The first is that this administration is not serious about controlling spending and following the laws enacted by this General Assembly with the budget. Supplemental num uh, numbers this year that have been submitted by him for requests for this fiscal year are way too high. We need to find a way to get that spending under control. The two biggest offenders of overspending are, as usual, suspects, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Corrections. The government proposal says that DHS needs an additional $492 billion in the current year. When you dig into the proposal, you can see they also bury another $307 million in current year costs we pushed into next fiscal year. That means DHS needs an additional $800 million just in this current fiscal year. That's an overage of 6%. Also had the pleasure, always a pleasure to talk with Senator Judy Ward. She gave her initial impressions of the budget address and also talked specifically about a proposal that several pro-life Republicans have uh, kind of winced at. It was a little entry in there about providing funding for Planned Parenthood. Well, the governor had his proposal for the budget uh, that we just listened to. Um, you know, 
Although he says there's no broad-based tax increases, there are tax increases in this budget. Um, there's an increase in spending, an increase in debt, and there's also um, debt that he wants to roll over into next year, which is not a very good practice for us as Pennsylvania. So um, we're going to look over this budget. We're going to digest it. We're going to delve into it as a caucus and then also in a bipartisan fashion. Um, I think we need to focus on the things that have made Pennsylvania successful in the past. We need to build on uh, our past successes uh, and borrowing and spending and rolling over debt are not things we want to be doing. So um, we're looking forward to, to working on it and getting it to a place where we can all be happy and, and we can all live with this budget, so thank you. There is uh, a very vague mention in the governor's budget on reproductive health, women's reproductive health, uh, which is very suspicious to me. Um, we're going to be looking, there was no detail given on that, but that's something many of us are going to be looking at very closely because I'm, I'm very fearful. That's a that was a red flag for me. So it's something we're gonna bird dog. I noticed it right away and um, others do as well. So we're gonna be bird dogging that to make sure that you know there's no funding for abortions and, and those sorts of things. One of our local legislators who was uh, in favor of what the governor had to offer was Dauphin County Representative Patty Ken. I was very pleased to hear what Governor Wolf had proposed in his budget. I think it really helps those who are especially vulnerable in our communities. I like how he is going to add more money for full day kindergarten for our students. I think full day kindergarten is so important, especially when kids are, are you know, uh, in their formidable years. I really liked how he put in $6 million for gun violence prevention, you know, the senseless deaths in our community. Uh, has been really painful, and I hope that that kind of funding will help prevent other lives. And then finally, I liked how he brought back increasing the minimum wage to $12 an hour, and then in increments of uh, 50 cents to $15 an hour. I think people living in poverty who work full time uh, need that boost and can really improve the quality of life. So very happy with the budget, and I hope that we can get most of it passed. And we continue with the Republican senators. We talked to the President Pro Tem Joe Scarnati, Republican Senator, for his impressions of Governor Wolf's budget proposal. Well, it's taken five years in the governor and the liberal Democrats in this building to understand we are not going to raise taxes. We're not going to raise fees to fund more government. So this budget follows the suit of what I believe was a foundation that we set. You know, it's a foundation that we really rested on when Governor Wolf came into office and uh, we had our battles, uh, but he started off with no taxes and there will be no taxes. But I'm just a little concerned with some of the policy initiatives. Uh, one of the policy initiatives and the cuts is for safe schools. You know, how do we talk about gun violence on one hand and we cut a program which I created uh, to keep our school administrators, our faculties, and our students safe. You know, so you know, there's there's got to be a balance here of what we're doing and how we do it uh, on these policy initiatives. Uh, but uh, you know, the governor uh, I think has been very reasonable in some sense. But um, yeah, this is we go back to all the major cuts to lines that we care about, our agricultural lines and lines that have to do with uh, you know rural issues. But when you look at this budget and you know 15 lines in the budget make up 75 percent of the spending, uh, gives little room for things. But uh, we'll get this spending uh, in a uh, more reasonable area. Uh, we'll make investments uh, that uh, pay off, and we'll continue the path we started five years ago which is a very good conservative route to go to keep Pennsylvania as a leader that we've been for these past years. Okay, there was some non-budget stuff going on too. Went to a couple of press conferences, one involving Representative Donna Bullock, a Democrat out of Philadelphia who was nice enough to host me in her office. So I eavesdropped to find out what uh, she was talking about and she was remembering and honoring those who are victims of gun violence. And she says that involves more than just those who are killed by guns. It's about their family. It's about their friends and loved ones. It's about 
those who witness or hear about gun violence in their communities every single day. It's about the children in my community who go to sleep, who work in classrooms, and who play on basketball courts with the sounds of gunfire in the background. It's about those same children who hear about gunfire and gun violence on the news and at the dining table and the whispers in the hallways of the classroom. It's about those same children who fear their lives and believe that the only solution to be safe is to arm themselves. It's about the same children like my two little boys who walk down a block and see candles and teddy bears and understand at a very early age it means that somebody has lost their life. Also talked with Representative Tina Davis of Bucks County who has authored legislation to help curtail the use of solitary confinement in Pennsylvania's prisons. Honestly, I just got letters from inmates across the state, a normal because they used to live in my district and then they explained it to me what was going on and then I started doing research and um, it's happening every day. And it seems like I didn't realize it's this small. Did you or? No. It's kind of scary when you're in there and you shut the door because it's so tiny. Smaller smaller than a horse stable, I said. No, it, I see you had a lot of support. Do you think this is going to be bipartisan in two or? It's going to be difficult. I'm hoping in the next couple years we get some people that are interested in this subject. It's hard to talk about because nobody, uh, everybody in, in normal life doesn't think about this. So when you really do and you really look at the research and things like that, you start, then you start getting upset about it because all the research shows that if you put in a person in a box like this longer than 15 days, they will start breaking down mentally. Well, thanks, Al. That does it for us, and we hope you enjoyed this week's show. To learn more about the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference and the Diocese of Harrisburg, please visit pacatholic.org and hbgdiocese.org. From all of us at the Diocese and the Catholic Conference, thank you for watching and have a great week.